And my final guest for the hour, I'm very excited uh, for this one, uh, and I'll introduce him right now, is Jack Hiddery, the CEO of Sandbox AQ. Round of applause for Jack. Hey, Arjun. Hey, Jack. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, <sighs> right, so we've been it's talking DIY about... here. You have to get, bring your own water. <laughs> that one sorted you out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jack, um, Sandbox is at this really interesting uh, intersection of artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Yes. Um, just give us a like, little idea of what you do. Break it down. Well, what we realize is that when we talk about advanced compute, AI LLMs are just a piece of the puzzle. There's a lot more tools in the tool chest beyond just LLMs. And when we think about our physical world, we think about wanting to make new drugs, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, those four have bedeviled the life sciences industry as an example. Yeah. LLMs are wonderful, we use them every day, but they're not gonna solve these issues because if the data was in the web to train LM on about how to solve Alzheimer's, we'd have solved it already. Yeah. So in this case, 2023, Arjun, was definitely the year of generative AI. 2024 begins also the year of generative data. How do we make new data using equations that can help us drive towards these new solutions? So this nexus of both AI, massively powerful tool, as well as on the quantum side, the physical world of high dimensional compute, bringing these two together is very, very pregnant with possibility. So let's pick up this, this data creation piece, because I think that's fascinating. And correct me, I'm gonna try to lay out what I think I know about it, and correct me if I'm wrong. So you've got AI, and it's trained on a bunch of data, but that data is not always complete. There might be missing bits of it, or there might not be parts of it uh, that are complete in order to, to bring up an answer, i.e., um, why does this disease happen, or what drug can cure this disease, for example. Uh, but with AI, uh, and this, this intersection of AI and quantum computing. AI simulation. AI yes. simulation. What can happen is AI can look at the data and go, well, there's bits missing, but I can take a very educated guess as to what that piece of the puzzle missing might be and therefore create a bigger picture. Now, I've, I've perhaps oversimplified it, but is that along the right lines? It's along the lines, but right. it's, even more, it's even more striking than that. Right. Because when it comes to, say, a new drug or a new battery chemistry, we all know about the electric vehicle revolution. We want to see batteries that mm. can take us farther instead of just uh, 500 kilometers of range, maybe seven, 800 kilometers of range. We also want batteries that can store energy coming from solar and wind yeah. for the clean energy revolution, climate change. And so when we want to have breakthroughs like that, there actually isn't very much data at all to right. download. Actually there, we kind of have to start from scratch with whole cloth new data. Now, how do we create this data? Well, the good news is that we know the equations that govern ions and atoms and molecules, right? We know those equations. Those were given to us 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, we're here in Switzerland. Many of them were created right here at the ETH in Zurich and other locations in Switzerland, along with a few locations across Europe by Einstein, by Bohr, by Schrodinger, by Heisenberg, by those individuals. Until two years ago, Arjun, we didn't have the compute capacity on this earth to run those equations at scale. Mm. So the same GPUs that we're all familiar with that have driven the LLM revolution, yeah. these graphic processing units um, from NVIDIA, from Alphabet, from Amazon, from so many companies, these GPU units now we can use in another way. Instead of just using it to train for LLMs, we can actually have them run simulation algorithms to run the equations that govern molecules, that govern ions, that govern atoms, and we can, say, generate simulations billions of times over of what a battery chemistry would be that doesn't have cobalt. Yeah. What a battery chemistry would be that doesn't have lithium. What would be a possible configuration of a drug that fits in to a receptor on a brain cancer tumor? Mm. Now, that takes the generation billions and billions of times, so it could take months, but that's the good news. It's, it, before that, it was impossible to do. Yeah. Now, once we have that data, then we apply deep learning. The neural networks you've been hearing about here today and across Davos, we apply those artificial neural networks to drive towards, towards a certain goal. For a drug, it might be, let's take all that simulation, let's find the one molecular configuration that not only fits into that receptor to hit pancreatic cancer or brain cancer, but also is soluble, it, we can create a pill out of it, has other characteristics that make it an actual drug. Mm. And we do all that, Arjun, to bring down the time and cost. Today it takes on average 15 years 
to develop one molecule to be a medicine. On average, three billion euro to do that. Yeah. We just sent Sandbox AQ, just took a molecule from UCSF, and we shaved in eight months of computation, shaved down eight years and a huge amount of money off this process. So this is happening now. You still have to go to clinical trial. Yeah. But you're going into clinical trial having tested it on billions and billions of virtual humans. Mm. Now, this is a powerful tool. This takes us, Arjun, well beyond LLMs into the land of AI and simulation. Wow. So where you, you mentioned, where are we at right now with this technology? Is it, is it early stage? Is it? It's working right now. So right this now. is okay. something that only emerged about 24 months ago because of the compute capability on the hardware side mm -hmm. from the GPU makers, yep. but also on the algo side, we and others working for years, literally, and then finally figuring out the algorithms to take these wonderful equations and convert them into a format that was more native to the GPU. Yeah. Now, one day in the future, we'll have quantum computers that will add even more fuel to this fire. Yeah. But what we're showing is today, right now, 2024, we can do this today on GPUs. Uh, quantum computers, Jack, just give us a breakdown. What are they? Why are they different to what we have now? Yeah. Quantum computers are fascinating devices that will take humanity to a whole nother level in terms of our capability to model our world, to create a digital twin of the things in our world. Mm -hmm. We are made up of atoms, we're not made up of bits. No. And so while we love the world of bits, we live in the world of atoms. And quantum computers are particularly good at creating a model of what the atoms do in this world. And so we call it sometimes now not a CPU, not a GPU, but a QPU, a quantum processing unit. Yeah. And there's many companies. We do not build quantum computers at Sandbox AQ because we're a software company. We're a company that makes the big enterprise software so that companies and governments and nonprofits and hospitals can use this software. But there are 30, 40 wonderful companies out there and nonprofits and academics building quantum computers right now. In the next number of years, we're gonna see more and more advances there. And what is a quantum computer? It uses a different kind of compute, not a transistor, not a semiconductor, but it can use a photon of light. It can use an atom. It can use a trapped ion. It can use a superconducting circuit. There's seven different ways to build a quantum computer. So this is actually a very diverse field with lots of opinions yeah. about how this is gonna be built. The good news is we're seeing really good progress over the last few years, and particularly the last year. And so I think in the next five, seven years, we're gonna see really good progress. But we start today with our GPUs, with doing AI simulation. Yep. These AI tools are really powerful, and then we'll add QPUs right. in a mesh to even create more power. So that's the roadmap. That's the roadmap. Uh, a couple of other interesting things. Uh, quantum sensing. This is something I saw on, on your website. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what is that? Because <laughs> again, we're looking for, for new technologies beyond the LLMs. Sure. So, so what is quantum yeah. sensing? Let's talk quantum sensing. Also, I want to make sure because yeah. I know one thing we've talked about is AI beyond LLMs. I want to talk about RAGs, another kind of AI as well. I think that it would be good to talk about this audience. But let's talk about quantum sensing first. Mm -hmm. So we've all actually been in a quantum sensor. Uh, if people have been in an MRI machine, you've been in a quantum sensor. Right. That's a quantum sensor, though, from the previous generation. The magic inside of that quantum sensor, the MRI machine, is that it's actually cryogenic. It's actually very, very cold in there, about as cold as it is in space. And so that makes the magic work for the superconducting coils that actually make the magnetic field to make an MRI work. But that's not a very practical device to bring to uh, rural areas, to bring in a little suitcase and things yeah. like that. So the next generation of quantum sensors, what we're developing at Sandbox AQ, do exactly that. Right. These are room temperature, these are small devices, and what can you do with these quantum sensors? First application is the heart. We know that ECG, EKG in some countries, electrocardiography is helpful, but really not complete. We all know stories of people who got a great physical exam, wonderful, A-OK, -okay, right, Arjun, and you go home, and then God forbid somebody has a heart attack three months after this wonderful physical. Why is that the case? Because the diagnostic tool of ECG is incomplete. Mm. ECG looks at electro, the electro field of the heart. But now with a quantum sensor, we can look at the magnetic field of the heart. Very faint, each of us right now in this studio, and yourself and myself, hopefully, all of us have hearts, are, have a magnetic field coming out of us. We can now detect that. 
You keep your shirt on, there's no wires, no gel, and in under three minutes, we can determine at a trauma center, does this person have a heart attack or not, and what kind of heart attack. Yeah. This device of Sandbox U is now in hospitals in clinical trial today in ER rooms. This is not a tomorrow thing, this is not 10 years from now, this is today. So quantum sensing is gonna be the first touch point for the majority of the billions of people on the planet with the quantum technology world. Quantum is not just about computing, but about sensing as well. This is a real tangible application mm -hmm. that you're going to see very soon. Um, if we can talk now about other kinds of AI. Yeah, you that mentioned makes sense. Rags. So um, this week in Davos, it's been all about AI and yep. generative AI. And AI, as we know, um, you can have interesting conversations with it. But I think as everyone here has tried, you often get hallucinatory mm -hmm. answers. People have asked various LLMs, how many people live on Mars? What's the population of Jupiter? And they get wild answers, two billion people, because the LLM read a science fiction novel. Yeah. Now, that might be fun for just playing around with LLMs, but if we want to have an LLM, for example, Arjun, that trains people to become doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. We want to scale the number of doctors and nurses, particularly in the developing world and the emerging markets and low and middle income countries. Well, it's not practical to say we're going to establish new medical schools everywhere. The money, if it was there, it would have been there already. So how do we do that? Here in Davos, a consortium of nonprofits and companies, Sandbox AQ helped put this together, created a new kind of LLM, an LLM that has on top of it a corpus of validated knowledge, in this case, medical and nursing textbooks. And these textbooks are validated and peer-reviewed, and we have the licenses to it. This is not a case where <laughs> we just grab something from the internet. We trained the LLM to say, use your language knowledge, use your facility to chat back and forth. But when it comes to healthcare training, creating lesson plans, interactive quizzes, training modules, even creating now multimodal, which means graphics and video. We now know multimodal LLMs mean that it's not just text anymore, yep. it's videos and images. When you do all that, LLM, look to this corpus, and that's called a retrieval augmented generator, mm -hmm. RAG or RAG. And this RAG allows us to train people, and we just launched it Wednesday of this week, right here in Davos, allows us now to go to thousands, millions, tens of millions of people and start training them in the next few weeks with this kind of LLM. And partners like Libratex and many others, Future Brilliance, are joining with us to make sure that we can get this out to low and middle income countries to increase the number of doctors and nurses, particularly we're focusing on women to join in as doctors and nurses in those countries. And so this is a very different kind of thing than just saying, okay, LLM, we're gonna train it on Wikipedia and Reddit and things like that, and let it also draw from that knowledge base. Mm. Having a different knowledge base, connecting that to an LLM, this RAG concept, I think is very powerful. I think we'll see more of that. Fascinating. Um, Jack, we've got a couple minutes left, so. I've been asking my guests this AI hour uh, about a couple of things. One of those is artificial general intelligence uh, and this idea that we have you know, human level AI or beyond human level AI. Uh, there's been a lot of debate around it, whether it's gonna happen soon or not, uh, whether what it looks like. What's your view on AGI? Do you think it's, it's close? Well, sorry, I'm just grabbing a sip of water here. <laughs> Arjun, the term of AGI has been overused so much, it's hard to even know what it means. Right. Sam Altman was here in Davos uh, this week and just this morning said he's not sure what it means, right? And so I think what we can say is that, you know, Alan Turing gave us the idea of a Turing test back in the 1955 paper. And I think we're well beyond some examples of Turing tests right now. On the one hand, software-based uh, AI is gonna be quite fascinating to see where it goes in terms of reasoning power, right, and common sense. One thing we've seen from current LLMs is very powerful, can write essays for college students like there's no tomorrow, but difficult sometimes to find common sense. Mm. And when you ask it, how do people cross the street, it can't even recognize sometimes what the crosswalk is versus other kinds of things, things that even a toddler would, would know. So, it's gonna be very interesting to go beyond that in terms of reasoning. Now, AI21 is an interesting company out there, uh, and it's a company that is started by uh, a number of really good AI experts, and they have an interesting belief that we have to combine neural network technology, the kind of technology that's led to today's um, fascinating stuff, but also with expert systems mm. to really have common sense. But I think one of the most powerful things we'll see this year, I'll make a prediction right here on stage and live on this program, 
This year, we'll see a ChatGPT moment for embodied AI, humanoid robots. Right. This year, 2024 and then 2025, we're not going to see robots rolling off the assembly line, but we're going to see them actually doing demonstrations of, in reality of what they can do using their smarts, using their brains, using LLMs, perhaps in other AI techniques, but doing things in the real world, in hospitals, in light assembly, in distribution centers, in a number of interesting applications. 20 companies have now been venture back to create humanoid robots, in addition, of course, to Tesla and many others. And so I think there's gonna be a fascinating convergence this year when it comes to that. Fascinating. I feel like I've spent, you know, three semesters at college in this, <laughs> in this 15 minutes we've been sp speaking. Thank you for the roller coaster ride through what is next for AI and the future. Uh, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. I hope you all did as well. Jack Hittery, the CEO of Sandbox. Thank, Thank you. you.